Well, ladies, you're filled up and filled up, spiritually filled up and filled up in your tummy. And uh, so we got to make it through one more. Um, I'm excited to hear and see what the Lord has done. And I'm, it's fun to get to meet you. I have some people traveling from far and wide to come to Whittier today. A lot of times people say, well, what freeway is Whittier Church by? And we go, no freeway, not anywhere near Whittier. It's all the way around Whittier. So I'm glad you're here. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for all that you have for us, all you've taught us, all the great reminders of um, those promises and um, sure, solid foundations that you have given us. We ask that you would um, speak to our hearts through this portion of the, the study, that you would bring home the lessons that you want us to take home today, and that we might be women after your own heart in a lost and dying wor world. And we ask that you'd have your way. Teach us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, when I do the women's Bible study, I usually put that whole front pew with chocolate, because I don't know what it is about the girls, but nobody likes the front row. On Sunday, there's a fight over the front row, but I should have brought the chocolate, because you're a little... <laughs> so um, in this session, we're going to do... We've been talking all day about foundational truths, and promises, um, truths that can't be altered, they can't be changed, negated, truths that can't be canceled or disproven or refuted, truths that can't be discarded or withdrawn or voided. Um, truth is sort of a, uh, a, a, a word that's bounced around these days and sometimes people say, well, that's my truth when it's not even true. <laughs> that's, that's what I think. But the truth that we have, the promises we have in God's word, they don't change. They're, they're, they're for us, and they're always um, going to be true no matter what. So as the daughters of the king of kings, his word is truth, and his word is eternal. And we have learned that his love is unconditional, and we have learned that his grace is beyond measure. And we have learned that he is sovereign and that he will be glorified in our lives as we surrender them to him. Um, his word is the most solid of foundations. I'm glad I'm not the only one that's warm. It was cold before, so I gave the cold girls a break. <laughs> and now us warm girls. Wait, I'm going to do shh. <laughs> um, he has given us the most solid of foundations. It's the cornerstone, the bedrock, like the picture. That's the cornerstone of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And um, it's amazing to, for us to think about something that, that looks pretty solid. And not, you can't move it. But um, his word is so much more solid and so much more powerful. And it can't be shaken and it can't be destroyed. Um, I hope that you have your, his sure word on, on your lap, on your phone, in your life, someplace where you can get, pick it up and grab it all of the time, always checking to see what he will, might have to speak to you and say, it's his love story to you. It's his guide map for every decision that you ever will have to make. You can take a look at his word and find that, those, that counsel. Um, and no matter the circumstance that you're facing today, um, in your life, his ho word holds true, and uh, it doesn't change, and he never changes, and he says that clearly. In James 1.17, it says, there is no variation or shadow of turning in him. Um, in Hebrews 13.8, it says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in Malachi 3.6, he declares about himself, I am the Lord, and I do not change. So every promise throughout this entire word is permanent, and it's true, and it's right, it's for us. Um, you might be today under a heavy burden. 
Um, you might feel all alone. You might have come in amongst all of these women, and I know it's possible to be amongst a, a whole bunch of women and still feel all alone. But you are, as his daughter, never, ever, ever alone. He promises to never leave us and never forsake us. And those are the things we're going to be talking about in this last session. Two more um, sure foundational promises. God is for you and he will never leave you or forsake you. Guaranteed, absolute promises. He's for you, he's on your side. He's never gonna leave you or forsake you. So let's look at first a foundational truth that's defined. Um, what has he promised? He's promised that he's for you, that he's on your side, that he's your savior, he's your Lord, he's your protector, your shield, your high tower, that's just a few of the descriptions that his word tells us about who he is. Um, he goes before you and behind you. Um, he'll fight your battles, all of them. The problem is sometimes we think we could fight them and then we realize we're you know, destroyed in an instant. But if we let him, he will fight our battles and he'll bring victory in our lives. He promises no matter what he allows, in our lives, that he has an amazing purpose for us. Amy talked about the hand of, of God's hand of love and nothing touches us as daughters of the King of Kings. Nothing touches our lives without him expressly allowing it for an express purpose, a good and perfect purpose. Um, he hasn't promised that everything's always gonna be easy or smooth sailing or without trial or fields of butterflies and you know what we'd like he but he has promised that no matter what we face we can have victory in him john 16 33 says it jesus himself said in the world you shall have tribulation not might or maybe or possible or kind of but you shall have tribulation but then he says this be of good cheer for i have overcome the world um, it's tr cl tr uh, truly outlined in his word that he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He's always on your side. His, that is so clearly outlined in God's truth. We're going to take a look for a few minutes at Romans chapter 8. Sally had to leave. Um, she has a, that her book on Romans is amazing. I just love the book of Romans. If you didn't pick it up, you know, go and get something. It's a great study, but because we can't be can't do the whole thing. Sorry, just a little bit. But Romans chapter eight, verse thirty-one. If you find that with me, it says this in verse 30, 31. What then shall we say to these things? There's a lot that comes before it. If God is for us, who can be against us? What a declaration that Paul was able to make, that he, with all that had gone on in his life, that all was happening with the persecution of the church and the spreading of the gospel, he said, what can we say then? If God is for us, who can be against us? Pastor Warren Wiersbe calls Romans chapter 8, the Christian's declaration of freedom. He says, because there are four spiritual freedoms that we enjoy in our Christian relationship with Jesus Christ. And a study of Romans chapter 8, he says, will tell you a lot about how powerful and how important it is for us to be fully dependent upon the Holy Spirit. 19 times just in, chapter, in this chapter, it talks about the Holy Spirit. And so um, he outlines the chapter 8 of Romans this way. Verses 1 through 4 talks about our freedom from judgment that there is no condemnation. You know, Romans 8, 1, I hope you have that memorized. There is therefore now no condemnation to who, those who are in Christ Jesus. And then eight, uh, chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, he says there's, we have freedom from defeat. There's no obligation. And 18 through 30, freedom from discouragement. There's no frustration. I don't know about you, but sometimes frustration is part of my system. But that's when I'm not depending on the Lord. And then in Romans 8, 31 through 39, where we're going to spend a little bit of time as we wrap up today, there's, we have freedom from fear. There's no separation in our lives. There's no condemnation because we share in the righteousness of God in Christ. The law can't condemn us 
There's no condemnation. There is no obligation because the spirit um, of God enables us to have the power to over become, overcome the flesh and to have victory in Christ. And there's freedom from frustration because um, we share in the glory of God as his daughters. We have the blessed hope of his soon return. I like to say it could be 312. Don't look at the clock. But any time that trumpet could sound, and we need to be ready and waiting for him. And then finally, in Romans 6 through 39, he says that we have freedom. We have, there's no separation because we experience the love of Christ. Paul presents five unchanging truths that we can stand on to tell us, to know for certain that there's no separation between the believer and the Lord. Uh, and the Lord. Um, in verse 31, he says, because God is for us. And in verse 32, it's because, he pro says, because Christ died for us. Verse 33, he says, God justifies us. In verse 34, he says, Christ intercedes for us. And in verses 35 through 39, he said, Christ loves us. So we don't have to just say, God is for me. Who can be against me? But how do I know that? But we have unchanging promises in his word that, says, that tells us that truth. That he's for us, that he died for us, that he justified us, that he intercedes for us, and that he loves us. Verse 31 says this. Um, what shall we say then? If God be for us, who can be against us? Um, the Father is for us, and he proved that by giving us his son. Uh, verse 32 says he did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. And how should he not with him freely give us all things? He was willing to give his only begotten son. That's how we know that he loves us. He was willing to send him to pay the penalty for every one of our sins. So the father is for us, and he proved it by giving us his son. The son is for us, verse 34 says, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, and is even at the right hand of God, um, always making intercession for us. So the son is for us because he sits at the right hand of God and he intercedes for us as we try to walk this life, go through making the right decisions and following after him. And the spirit is for us because in verse 26, it says, likewise, the spirit, he helps us in our weaknesses that we do not know what we should pray, how we should pray as we ought, but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that can't be uttered. You know those times when you don't even know how to pray? You can't even figure out what to say, but yet we can call on the Spirit and trust Him to be the one to intercede on our behalf. So the conclusion is obvious from these verses. If God is for us, and He is, then who can be against us? Many people might be against you in this world. And, um, and we know that we have to understand and recognize that, but our, the scriptures clearly says there's only one who really matters, and he is for us all the time. Um, therefore, we have to choose each day to recognize his promises and to own them as our own and to stand on the foundational truth, not of somebody's word, not of Amy's word or Sally's word or Pastor Jack's word or mine, but standing on the word of truth. And we have to trust him. Sometimes we could join in Jacob's lament. You remember what Jacob said? All things are against me. You ever said, all things are against me? You ever thought it? Maybe we don't say it out loud. But Jacob said, all things are against me. But when we fall into that trap, um, we are as wrong as Jacob was because God is always on our side. And yes, sometimes he get, puts in our lives hard trials that we would never pick and we wouldn't choose and we wouldn't want them. If we had our opportunity, we'd get them out in a minute, but he wants to walk us through them and change us by them and cause us to become more like him in the, in the midst. We don't have any need to fear. Our loving father only desires the best for us. 
And sometimes that best includes putting us in places where things are rough, tragic, super hard, a little bit frustrating, or all of those on the same day. Uh, but he's never going to leave you or forsake you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. You know it. You might have a plaque in your house and on your, you know, the front of your Bible. I, w I think I do even. Yes, I do. Um, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring you a future and a hope. What you might or might or might not know is that Jeremiah got that promise from the Lord given to him to tell the people who were in the Babylonian captivity. A pretty big trial. He was, they were sent into captivity because they were rebellious against God. And even though they were in idolatry and sin and he, God had to punish them with the captivity, God had a perfect plan for them a plan that was for good and for, not for evil, to bring a future and a hope. And he has the same for us today. No matter what trial we face, he has a good reason that he allows it so that we can be changed into him as his image. So God is for you. We know that for sure. And he cried, and verse um, 32 says, Christ died for you. It says he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. That's, that's the ultimate picture of love. Um, that breath, that, and then that day that breath came. I can't, I don't remember the words, but um, it's so amazing for us to remember. And when the enemy starts to tell us that's not true, we have his word to, to give us that sure proof. Um, if when we were sinners, God gave us the best, giving us his son, how much more is he willing to give you everything you need to have victory in your life? We're going through the book of James, and James says, if you lack wisdom, then ask me, and I will give it to you abundantly. I will throw my arms open and pour it out into your life so that you know how to handle the circumstances and trials in your life. God deals with us on the basis of Calvary grace, we talked about grace already, not on the basis of the law. We are so easily um, willing to condemn ourselves or to condemn others for their failures. But so, it's so amazing that God looks at us with gr that grace. And he said, I finished the work on your behalf. He's f freely willing to give it to us. So we don't need to earn it. Um, in fact, you can't. You're not able to earn God's grace. That's the nature of grace itself. Sometimes it's fun to be the third study in a day because I go, could do like, well, as Sally said or as Amy said, <laughs> but it's how the Lord wants us. To, we need to be reminded over and over and over again. Um, his work was finished at Calvary. You can't earn it. You can't lose it. And we live and breathe by the very grace of God. We wipe out in an instant and if we didn't have his grace. So he's for you, and he died for you. And verse 33 says that he justifies you. It says it is God who justifies. Clearly, easy, few words to understand. It's God who justifies. Um, this means that he declares you righteous in Christ. Righteous. Absolutely having no sin righteous in Christ. Um, I think if you woke up this morning and said, um, in Jesus Christ, I am righteous, it would really change how we did our day. But I don't think that that's the first thing that I should, that I'm loved, that his grace is unconditional, that he is sovereign, that he has given me his righteousness. I don't have anything of my own, and I have nothing to offer him, but our righteousness comes from him. It's God who justifies us. Um, one of your enemy's favorite tactics is to whisper in your ear that you're not worthy, that you're not, um, he's not willing, that he doesn't want to help you, he doesn't want to be with you, he's not with you. Sometimes he whispers it in your ear, sometimes he screams it in your face. But what do you do? God's word says, God's word says, and we stand upon that promise that we're chosen, we're elected, we're accepted, and that's a long list too. <laughs> and to understand the meaning of justification, 
will bring a peace to our hearts that we would never have otherwise. And when God declares the believing sinner to be righteous in Christ, that declaration never changes. It absolutely never changes. You might try to accuse yourself. Others might try to accuse you. They might not even try. They might accuse you. But God declares that you are righteous in him. And God is the one who goes before the judge. Um, and he, does, he doesn't take us to a court or accuse us. Because he's already, Jesus has already paid the penalty for every one of your sins and every one of mine. Not just the ones we did last week, not just the ones we did um, this morning, not the ones we're probably gonna do later on. Every single one of them he has justified. He has paid the penalty for our sins. We're secure in him. So we know for sure that he's for us because he died for because he's for us and he died for us and he justified us. And in verse 34, it says that Christ intercedes for you. We really have a dual intercession um, in this um, chapter in Romans. It says that um, we are secure in Christ because the Spirit intercedes for us in verse 26 and 27. And the Son of God intercedes for us in verse 34. So every time we wake up and breathe, then, the, then Jesus says that the, at the throne and go, that's mine, she's mine, she's mine, she's mine. You can't accuse her, you can't give her, you can't get, say this, you can't do that, you can't, she belongs to me, and I have justified her, and I'm interceding for her. So, and then lastly, we know that he's on our side. We know that he justifies us, that he intercedes for us. And then in verses 35 through 39, it says that Christ loved us, loves us. It says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it is written, for your sake all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, Paul says, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For he says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities or powers or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, nothing will separate us. Paul proved that God cannot fail us. Will we fail him? Absolutely but he cannot fail us. And Paul explains in these five verses that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And he clearly states that God, um, even though he doesn't shield us from difficulties, just take a look at Paul's um, testimony, you know, shipwrecks and, you know, famine and sword and, you know, dead or almost dead, if not dead. Um, he says that he, all those things happened and they, God doesn't shield us from the difficulties, but we, because we need them become, to become more spiritually stronger in him. The difficulties and the trials and the tribulations are not working against us. They're working the love of Christ in us. Um, he uses the trials for his glory. It says that we suffer for his sake. We endure the trials for his sake. And, when, and since we do, he's not going to desert us. And according to verse 37, it says that we have the power to conquer not on our own, we'll never make it. We have like less than a second, we'd be crushed. But we have the power to conquer that says we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, literally super conquerors in him. The only way we win the battle is to stand firmly on the truth of God's word, to know what the foundations are, to know the sure and certain promises in him. So start a list if you don't have one, if you didn't already this morning, of those promises that you can stand on that prove that um, God loves you, that prove that his grace is sufficient for you, that prove that he's sovereign. Um, I'll tell you a few that I wrote down to, for the, knowing that he's on your side. Psalm 118 verse 6 says, The Lord is on my side. It's easy to understand. 
And um, he says, I, the psalmist says, I will not fear what man can do to me. Psalm 56 verses eight and nine says, you number my wanderings, you put my tears in your bottle and um, they are, are they not in your book? And when I cry out, then my enemy will turn back for this I know because God is for me. He's not against you. He's on your side. Hebrews 13, five through six says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with what you have for the Lord himself has said. Um, I think that Gia Setment talked about the fact that there are some things that are really clearly God's will. Well, the Lord himself has said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. So when the enemy whispers in your ear or screams in your face, God's not on your side, he's out to get you, then you can say, Hebrews 13, five through six says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And it says, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man can do to me. And verse eight says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When it was written, he was, that was the truth, and it still is today in 2018. So one thing is certain, walking in victory in the midst of the world which we live in, a lost and dying world that's so desperately in need of what we have in Christ, is only possible if we possess an eternal perspective. If we have our eyes on the Lord and if we're standing on the truth and when we know that if there's trials facing us, then the, and the Lord has a perfect plan for us. We know who he is. We have to know what he has done and um, that he will soon return to take us home. 3.30 maybe. <laughs> it's four minutes, could happen. <laughs> While we're here, um, no matter what the circumstances, what the hardships, I know you all have a story that you could go, I don't want this hard part in my life, except the hard part came because the Lord has a perfect purpose for it. Um, and no matter what the circumstances, we can know for certain that God is for us and he's on our side and he'll never leave us or forsake us. So we know what the promise is that was defined. It's declared through the word and those are just a couple of um, uh, references, so make your own list so that you have it. Um, if you're technical and you got your smartphone, you can put a note and a reminder and every day one could, I, can, I can't do that, but <laughs> I know it's possible. And the, that promises can pop up. You, we have to stand on his truth. So let's take a look at this foundational truth demonstrated in the life of the saints of the past. When Sally said, turn with me in the Old Testament, I went, oh, don't say, because you never know if we got the same thing. But then I always think, well, if we got the same example, God thought we forgot about it earlier. <laughs> so Hebrews 12 says that we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before us, who have walked the hard, rocky path of, of um, following after God and found victory in that path. And there are so many examples. Jack's teaching through the book of Psalms on Sunday morning. And I can't tell you how many Psalms I went. Oh, yeah, I'm putting that in the study. Oh, that one was a good one. No, that was a good one. I couldn't put them all. So Psalm 77 um, says this, as a Psalm of Asaph. And it says that he cried out to the Lord in his distress. And listened to his heartfelt plea. Because I bet that you might have said something like it at some time. In verse 1 through 4 he says, I cried out to God with my voice. To God with my voice. And it said twice. He said, and he gave ear to me in the day of my trouble. I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and I was troubled. I complained in my spirit and I was overwhelmed. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Verse seven through nine says, will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promises failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Is he angry and has he shut up his tender mercies? 
such a hopeful moment for him. What a heartbreak that he would cry out. That's such an amazing part about going through the Psalms is we see real broken hearts, real struggle, and find out how those saints of old responded. Maybe you've had a night like Asaph had, or a week, or a season, or longer, where you're like saying, God, where are you? I don't get it. I can't remember. I don't know what you're doing. He was in a predicament that um, sometimes we find ourselves in. So we can look at Psalm 77 and say, what did Asaph do? And verse 10 through 15, it says this. He said, then I remember, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders of old. I will also meditate on your work. I will talk of your deeds. Your ways, O God, are in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Who are the, um, who, you are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the people. You, and you um, have with your arms redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. When Asaph didn't know where God was and he couldn't see what he was doing and he was brokenhearted and thought God was not going to hear him, he chose, like we need to, to remember God's promises, to stand upon them, to remember what God had done before, to what he, what he had seen him do, what he knew about his faithfulness, what he knew about his sovereignty, what he knew about his grace. He said, I will remember, I will remember, surely I will remember, and I will meditate, and I will talk about you. And so when we find ourselves in a place like that, we do this very same thing. Surely we remember. We go back and we find out remembering who God was, what he had done, what he had promised, that he filled his heart and mind with the truths of God's word, even when he didn't see him at work in his life. And he trusted him. He spoke of God's faithfulness, and he stood on the foundational truth of God's word and his promises. And we need to follow his good example in our lives. Maybe you remember a guy called Habakkuk. Um, he was the last of the minor prophets, and he was sent to preach to the children of Israel prior to the Babylonian captivity. He was a priest and a Levite and a musician. He had, he had it all, that was a lot of gifts. His name means wrestler, and it says that um, he was living in the time when the righteous king Josiah had just recently died in 609 BC. And the spiritual state of the Hebrew people had spiraled immediately into wickedness and rebellion. And Habakkuk looked around at his people, this godly man, a priest, a Levite, a musician, loving the Lord, um, looked around at the awful state of his people, like sometimes we look around at the awful state of the world we live in, and he cried out to God. And Habakkuk 1, verses 1 through 3 says, the burden of the prophet Habakkuk saw, the Lord, oh, how long shall I cry to you? How long will you hear? Not, how long will you not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to, um, to see trouble? There's plundering, there's violence um, ever before me. There's strife and there's contention. So basically Habakkuk said, God, look what's happening, and why are you letting this happen? Why are you allowing your people to live this way and to go this way, and it was breaking his heart. And maybe he didn't expect God to answer, but God did, because verse six says, God says, let me tell you what I'm gonna do, and you're not gonna like what you hear. He said, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, um, a bitter and hasty nation, he described them. And he said, they were evil and vicious. They were an idolatrous people, far worse than the children of Israel. And he said, I'm gonna bring an evil and wicked people to judge my rebellious people. And I know that doesn't make sense to you, Habakkuk. 
that's not the answer you wanted to have, but that's, what's, that's what I'm doing. You're gonna just have to trust me. Have you ever had to be in a spot where you said, I'm just gonna have to trust God because I don't know what to do and I don't know what he's doing. So in chapter two, Habakkuk says, I will stand my watch. I will set myself in the rampart in the tower. I will watch and see what God will say to me. And I will, um, and I will answer when I'm corrected. I guess he knew he was gonna need some correction. When the Lord answered me and said, so in chapter one, Habakkuk says, what are you doing? And God said, this is my plan. And in chapter two, Habakkuk went and he sat and he waited and he expected to hear from the Lord. And he asked the Lord to direct him and to show him what he wanted, what he was gonna do. This time he expected to hear from God. And like you and I, he submitted his will and his expectation to the Lord. When we don't know what's happening, we can trust the Lord. We have to trust him in the midst of it. Um, what God was doing in our lives might not make sense. It might not be according to our plan, but he has the most, gives us a most valuable, extra foundational truth in um, Habakkuk chapter two, verse four. He says, the just shall live, how? By faith. The just shall live by faith. Have faith. Habakkuk, you don't understand, you're not going to understand, but you're just going to have to trust me. The just shall live by faith. That's a truth that's repeated in Romans 1, in Galatians chapter 3, and Hebrews chapter 10. He didn't understand, but he submitted and he surrendered and he was determined to trust. And so if there's something in your life today that you don't understand why God's allowing it, then we need to submit to him and trust him and allow him to show us. So he went from I don't get it in chapter one to I'm gonna listen and trust by faith in chapter two. And then in chapter three, it says that Habakkuk, basically a quick summary, he worshiped. In verses 17 and 19, he says this, Though a fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, the labor, the labor of olives may fail, though the fields have no food, though there's no flock, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, there's no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation, for the Lord is my strength, and he will make my feet like deer's feet or hind's feet, and he will make me to walk on high places. He said, I don't see it. I don't know what's happening. I don't understand what you're going to do, but I'm going to sit, I'm going to listen, I'm going to wait, and I'm going to worship, because that's what he wants his daughters to do even when we don't understand. We serve the same righteous, faithful, holy, loving God today as Habakkuk did. And he's waiting to make our feet like deer's feet. He's wanting us to be able to dance through the trial, to sing in the rain. I always love those pictures where that little kid is just like, ah! in the rain. <laughs> I don't want to get wet, but I should more often maybe. And um, he wants us to be able to walk in faith when we don't understand. Um, he says he won't leave you or he, he will never leave you or forsake you. He said his, he's on your side. Um, if we had time, we could talk about Joseph and David and Paul. We talked about Rahab already. We could study Hebrews 11. So many have gone before, standing on the foundational truths of these promises. We have seen that his word is declared. Uh, he has declared the promise that he has demonstrated in the life of the saints. We'll just wrap up with one more thing. We want to see these foundational truths displayed in our lives as we leave today. Not, oh, that was a great conference. What did you learn? I don't really remember. It was good, though. I really liked it. <laughs> Have you done that? Sometimes you go, oh, that was great. What did you learn? I don't, I don't remember about it. <laughs> we need to say, we can maybe make that fourth D, just say, do it. Go put it into practice and do it. Let's go from the church today and determine to live in these foundational truths, to stand on them, so that when the trials come, when the storms hit, 
when things happen that you never expected, you can say, I know that God loves me. I know his grace is sufficient. I know he is sovereign. I know he will be glorified. I know he won't leave me or forsake me. I know that he is on my side. Psalm 91 verses one and two says, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high will abide under the shadow of the almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress in God, my God whom I will trust. And God's response in verse 14 sex says this, and I just put a she in place of all the he, I think that's okay. Because she has set her love upon me, therefore I will deliver her. Um, I will set her on high because she has m known my name. She shall call upon me and I will answer her. I will be with her in trouble. I will deliver her and I will honor her. And with long life, I will satisfy her. I will show her my salvation. His promises are true and certain. They're not gonna change. We live in dark days, getting darker all the time. That's not a surprise to God. If you read the scriptures that say what it's gonna be like in the last days, we're not even there yet, I don't think. It's getting there, but um, it's certain that the trumpet could sound any minute. I'll give you another time. <laughs> there's, no, it's no, there's no time for us to be weak-kneed and, and tossed to and fro and getting kicked around by every wind of doctrine. We need to know his word. We need to stand firmly upon it. We, need not, we can't be complacent about the last days. There are people around your life and my life that are dying without Jesus. And the only reason why he left us here is so that we could tell him. And I know you heard Jack say, if you're here, you know, if the otherwise he just, you could get saved and he could take you home. Okay, got that one out of here, got that one. But he left us here for a purpose. We have, a, we have the answer. We have his sure and certain promises. He is sovereign in our lives. Isaiah 28, 16 says, so this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay in Zion a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the one who trusts in him will never be dismayed. Never, like a tree planted by the rivers of water, roots that go so deep that nothing could knock it down. This is our sure foundation. And when we're standing upon it, nothing will knock you off. And it's not anything we can do. We just stand in his grace. We abide in his love. He fills us up to overflowing. And then he says, go out there and tell them. Because if they see us with that hope and that love and that grace and that mercy, you can bet there's plenty around you that want it, even if they don't know it. They want it. So you might have been here all day. Maybe somebody drug you to an all-day conference. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe all of this sounds like, well, sort of foreign. And he promises to give us that as soon as we come to him, he, he'd finish the work. We've sung about it. We've talked about it. He knew we needed a Savior he knew we couldn't do it on our own. And he sent his only begotten son to die in our place so that our sins would be forgiven, every single one of them. And all he says is believe it, believe me, come to me. And so if that is not a decision you have made, then don't go out the doors without making that one. Um, but just remember that he's calling, asking you to call and he will answer. If you knock on the door, he'll open it. And, he, and he'll come in and you'll be a brand new person and you'll find a whole book full of promises that never change. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. We ask that you would have your way in the midst. Lord, we don't want to leave not having left the things that we have struggled with at your feet. And Lord, I ask that you would have your um, way in the midst of each one of these women, that you would receive our praises, that you would transform us by your word, that you would fill us by your spirit. And we just give you um, our lives. We submit them to you like Habakkuk, who didn't understand but was willing to trust 
and walk by faith, we'll do the same. We make the same commitment and we worship you. And we thank you in Jesus' name.